Welcome to the Mindspace Podcast. I'm Joe Flanders. Thanks for tuning in. The Mindspace Podcast is my personal, in-depth exploration of the science and practice of well-being. I'm sharing this journey with you because I believe we can all lead happier, more meaningful lives by getting the facts and training our minds. Join me as I learn and share the most inspiring insights about human flourishing from leading experts, because we could all use a little more mind space. My guest today is Connor Melander. Connor is the guitarist, vocalist, and keyboardist for the Montreal indie band Half Moon Run. The band debuted with their 2012 album Dark Eyes, which was very successful both commercially and critically. They just finished recording their third album, and I spoke to Connor a couple of weeks before they hit the road for a big tour that spans over this summer and fall, and it takes them across Canada, the U.S., and Europe. As you'll hear, Connor is thoughtful and introspective and has a lot to say about art and creativity, the music business, psychology, and mindfulness. Without any further delay, here's my conversation with Connor Melender. Connor Merlander, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. I just learned that I wasn't exactly pronouncing your name right. How do you say it in the proper Scandinavian pronunciation? I think it's Molander. Wow. When I say that to Swedish people, their eyes light up. <laughs> <laughs> is, is your background Swedish? My great-grandfather was born in Sweden, and he emigrated in the 30s. Um, other than that, I'm mostly German in my background. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Maybe you can get us started by telling us who you are and what you do well i'm a musician i'm one of the members of a band called half moon run from montreal and um i've been doing that for almost 10 years i i grew up in british columbia and i moved to montreal actually to go to mcgill after high school i applied to mcgill and i got in actually into the psychology department and thought that part of me thought i wanted to be a teacher and part of me thought that i would be a psychologist like you and and um, it was only a few months after I moved to Montreal that I met the guys in the band when I was when I was a teenager I loved playing music I was always trying to start little projects but um, everybody tells you that it's not a good idea to, to try to rely on that as a career and to have a backup plan and all those things um, and so I never really believed that it was a viable option although some part of me thought that I could maybe pull it off if I met the right people and so that was why I moved I decided to go to university here in Montreal because it's got that great reputation um, of being a center of the arts and all that and somehow luckily I did meet people right away that I found to be great collaborators um, I met the singer Devin through a Craigslist ad which no way. was like crazy hey and, and um and, and then we start, I think, remember the first jam that we had was maybe three months after I moved to Montreal and it was really great. It was really different. I, I was 19 and um, I'd, I'd had chances before uh, jamming with people, you know, when I was a teenager and all that. And usually what happens is that everybody plays, um, tries to show how good they are, you know, and, and so they play loud and they play often. But I found with this group of people right away that everybody was listening and the room was really quiet. And that was the first indication that there was real chemistry there. Um, but then the other thing that these people were, were that they were really focused and um, had a sense that if you want to if we want to do this, then we really have to do it. So right away, there was a pressure on um, my university, um, you know, endeavors. And and uh, it was only after one year that I had to basically decide between the two things, between studying psychology and uh, the band. And so I dropped out after one year. And then that started a whole... Uh, it, an uncertain period in my life because it took another year or two before we were able to write enough material to record an album and that, since then things have gone well but uh yeah it was it was uh, quite something for a while so things have gone well for you guys H- uh, how many albums have you done so far we just finished recording our third album and it'll come out later this year right so you recorded it this spring i guess mm-hmm. and uh, what's in store for listeners well, this is this is actually, I guess, technically the first time I've talked about the new album uh, in any kind of interview form. Um, we've been wor- working on it for almost two years. We're not the fastest writers. Um, we can talk about that later. How? Yeah. Because the, yeah, um, the, it's it's a little bit interesting, I think. Uh, we wrote more material than we 
might have needed for a conventional record um, for a bunch of reasons to have to be able to pick from a wider pool but also to be able to stay hopefully stay more prolific than we've been in the past it's been a few years since our last record um, lots of different styles some stuff that we just wrote in the past few months some that we've been working on for like six years um, so uh, I feel great about the new record um, and uh, I guess we'll see. You don't at this point. We're mixing it right now. I don't really know what it is anymore. You know, it gets to a certain point. I think people who 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 do like long uh, term creative projects know that once you dive into it um, uh, for a certain period of time, you you can't see it from the outside very very well anymore. And I think that when uh, I get a reaction from the public, I'll know kind of more what it's about. Right now, I'm just trying to think like, is that snare too compressed? Is that, you know, are, are the, is the vocal balance right? Um, those kind of things. Well, you've set the bait, so now I'm, I want to jump right into it. Maybe right. you can talk about what the creative process is for the band when you guys are writing and coming mm -hmm. up with new material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in the early days, in the early, I guess in the early days, that's when we kind of set the, uh, f it's not a formula, but just the, the way that we interact as songwriters collaborating. That's the main, that's the main kind of thing that characterizes, especially my experience uh, in this group is that it's collaborative, which is really different, I think, from just single-minded individual um, creative pursuits. Um, so uh, Devin, our lead singer, We'll often have some kind of little uh, guitar lick or a vocal melody or something like that, and then it's kind of on us to um, respond to that and to provide counter melodies and and, and kind of rhythmic um, rhythmic counterpoint. I would say that the the rhythm in our in our music is often lyrical in its own way. It's not, it, it, and and that's that's I, has to do a lot with Dylan, our drummer, being a, a, a classically trained piano player. But anyway, like we, it's kind of uh, after when the initial idea, sometimes it comes from Devin, sometimes it comes from other people, gets thrown out there. It's this kind of negotiating process that where whatever you kind of hear, um, you try to throw that out there and offer it, and then we wrestle with it. And sometimes that process takes one afternoon, and then everything kind of falls into place. And sometimes it takes years uh, for it to to kind of um, refine or the kind of like reduce to what the common. Or what the what the most potent elements are, um, you, you I think the music often has a feeling where each voice can stand alone. You can hear it if you put headphones on, especially you can hear it stand alone. Um, but you can also hear how it fits almost geometrically into the sonic spectrum, and uh, that's something that we're always looking for. Not kind of stepping on each other's toes. Often with guitar music, I find that. Um, you know, it's just, there's these kind of just blocky stacking of drums, bass, and rhythm guitar, often two rhythm guitars, lead guitar on top, and then things are just kind of stacked really like bricks on top of each other, and it, it can obscure things, and I find it dilutes things. Um, so we try to stay a little bit more three-dimensional in, in that regard, and so that process takes a long time. And Do you guys have a sense of when something becomes a commercial success because you've had a you've had quite a few hits mm -hmm. do you know when you have a hit does it feel different when you're writing it or you just sort of put stuff out there and see what the response is well the first couple hits that we had were two songs in particular um full circle and call me in the afternoon way back in the early days and in those days we had no idea because uh we didn't even have a record deal. We had never played a show. We were just jamming for each other, and um, and we were just playing for fun. We well, we we were serious, but we were playing for fun. And so then, when those songs got picked up um, later on on the radio, all over the place, um, we kind of would would tell ourselves that we kind of knew what okay that that one worked and so and so uh maybe similar things like that would work but to tr tell you the truth i really can't predict i really can't predict and we've actually I, I will admit we have tried to write hits um like in some sense there's no shame in that we're all trying to make a living and like so if you can write something that's going to get on the radio all over the place and make a bunch of money like that'd be great you know and we tried <laughs> yeah. uh and it felt so rotten uh basically right away um that uh it just became not feasible to, to c carry on down that path one time when we were recording the first album uh 
we we wrote something like that that we thought might be a hit and but it felt really disingenuous it felt really rotten and so uh but then certain people that we were involved with making the record at the time on the business side of things also thought that it had the potential to be a hit so it became a point of uh it was tense you know they said you have to record that thing and at that point we were way on we were way past it we said no we won't do it and they they really tried to force us to and i remember the, at that point there was just the three of us it was before isaac had joined and uh we went and sat out on this dirt road and just said you know we're not coming back in until you tell us that we don't have to do it you know um yeah not not because we you know uh, i guess i guess it's one thing to say that you'll do something like that and it's another thing to go through it and yeah. right mm-hmm. so there is if i understand your job a chronic tension between commercial constraints Mm -hmm. and your own expression as an artist Mm -hmm. i'm curious how you think about that in particular because i find i mean music is like magic in a way right it just Mm -hmm. it moves people Mm -hmm. um, it helps people see new connections in their lives Mm -hmm. it helps them feel certain ways or work through certain emotional experiences Mm -hmm. certainly when i was younger i used to see a lot of concerts and Mm -hmm. found um, the experience sometimes be therapeutic in a way yeah and yeah, I'm just curious how you navigate that yeah. and the fact that, as you say, you need to make a living and uh, that there are other demands on your on your time and energy. Yeah, yeah. I think a few things about that. I think from the inside, since my job is as a musician, a lot of that kind of magic, it's... N- of course, I believe in what you're saying about the magic. But, um, that's why I got into it, because I felt the same way that you're describing. But um, when you really try to look at it, when I look at the nuts and bolts of what I do and how the songwriting process goes and how I feel when I'm analyzing a song that we're working on, you're, 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 chasing, uh, you're chasing emotional um, feelings and you're trying, to, you're trying to keep them alive inside you as you can, and, and to keep them alive inside the music. But it's not... The, the the magic is more. It, I, th- I think that it's uh, something that people more assume from the outside than more than I feel from the inside. At a certain point, you know, um, and 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 I also th- so I think that that's kind of a, maybe an unconventional um, thing to say about as a musician. That because like, I, I do hear musicians talk about how the magic of music and how. But what, when I think about it, it's really. I, I, well, it, I, I don't. I don't mean to diminish the emotional uh, uh, kind of uh, value that I feel towards it, but it's more that I I, I I try to take care of the the technical side of of of, um, of the craft, you know, and and that is not so magical, you know. You, you have to your fingers have to be able to do things. You have to have. Uh, certain access to harmonic access to be able to improvise effectively and that takes work and uh then when i'm tr- when you're tr- you, you you look at other styles and you try to incorporate different rhythmic motifs and harmonic motifs so that you have more of a versatile palette to work with and all that and once you start to think about it that way when i'm when i'm working with the band if i hear something that I, you know i think that i might want to add this interval or i think i might want to add this kind of rhythm um it becomes more like uh, almost like a construction work you know and that you that you have to kind of move back and forth in your mind between that and then understanding the emotional, um, you know, the the emotional effect that you're trying to preserve. And I think that that, so when I think about it that way, that's that's not so different from from lots of different kinds of jobs. You know, being a teacher, you, you have to you have to maintain a kind of emotional interest with your students in order to be able to teach them effectively, keep them emotionally engaged or, you know, during doing your job as, as, a, as a clinical psychologist or, or you have to be able to, you know, again, um, your, your, your kind of professional toolkit and your kind of emotional awareness are, are in tune to achieve an effect. And, and so um, the music has a, a, a certain mysticism surrounding it that I don't know is necessarily unique to mm-hmm. um, the fine arts, you know? And so then when you relate it back to um, commercial uh, commerciality and that kind of thing, well, I just got back from a trip to Greece, you know, and, and uh, just two days ago, and I was looking at um, the Acropolis, the amazing old city. And when I think about the Acropolis, it's impossible not to think of, you know, Pericles, the, the, the statesman who ordered all those things to be built. And just like last year, we, we talked about how I went on a trip to, to Florence in Italy, and it's impossible to separate all that great art from the Medicis who, again, kind of ordered that to be, to be built. It was all commercial, you know, um, and without the kind of commercial push, the facilitation to to make those things happen wouldn't be there and so i think that there might be um 
and I, I kind of have little theories that bubble up in my mind about why this might be, but but um, that there might be a a a, a kind of a marriage uh, in the perception of the fine arts with this kind of mystical um, mystical feeling, magical feeling that isn't necessarily justified as far as I can tell. Yeah, it, it's I a bit think, romanticized. It's a bit romanticized. I think that the arts um, m might be more similar to other walks of life than people might think. Yeah, well, I, I like this, you know, the sense that um, you're kind of playing on two channels. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's the, the technical aspect that, that is important. Yeah. And if it's not there, the music will not be received in the way that you want right but you're also tracking the emotional impact right in parallel right exactly yeah i kind of feel this 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 conversation moving towards um the way that mindfulness and creativity yes. um interact you know because i think both of these things have something in common and it's kind of like they have something inversely in common mm -hmm. um which is um creativity when, when we say that there's one sense in which you can mean that word like that has that magical mystical kind of um meaning to it um um, and uh, but then if you expand that to mean anything if you're you're creative when you think oh, like I have a problem with my friend and I don't know how to sol solve it you know and then you think of a new way that you can be nice to them or, or something like that you know or like my my root my house is too messy and I know I build these shelves you know there's like creativity can involve all those kinds of things um, and, and then and, and in parallel with mindfulness, what, the way I think about it, well, there's the practice of mindfulness, but then there's the kind of mindful thinking that is broader than that, right? When you mm -hmm. just think like, just when, when, when you started to teach me about mindfulness, I started to think about the ways that everybody kind of knows this in a way, like it, it, when you it's, take a breath, you know, take, take a breath and count to 10, you know, that's kind of the uh, uh, mindful thinking in a way, you know? Um, and so then when I think about so, so what, where I try to draw the boundaries bet between mindfulness and creativity, it's it's hard because it's it's not um, it's not clear when you're really engaging in a creative process versus a mindful process. It's hard to know where to draw the lines. But when I think about writing music or something or something like that, it's it, it's um, you you kind of go back and forth between being mindful of what you're doing and 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 then putting that aside you know mm -hmm. putting that putting the mindfulness aside in order to actually let some kind of sub personality in yeah. allow your allow that to inhabit you and and you kind of play a game with that yeah. you know anyway yeah i'll pick up on that mm -hmm. i think what's what's really interesting here is the sense of the appearance and disappearance of the self yeah and an awareness of the self right which is obviously a big part of meditation mm -hmm. and also any performative activity yeah right if you're going to write something you know creative or interesting um, you have to get out of your own way mm -hmm. and let this whole range of complex skills express itself without yeah. you interfering yeah but then sometimes you have to sort of check up check back in and say what am i doing am i on the right track right and, exactly and, and um, kind of evaluate or or just check in with the process. Yeah, yeah. And uh, interestingly, of course, there's a there's a subtle difference between a state of mindfulness and a state of flow. Right. Right. And it sounds like you're talking about mindfulness as a, a state of self awareness. Right. And then flow, uh, you sort of lose the sense of self, and you're just in the music or in the writing. And right. can you know sort of so dial into the between unconscious. The, the, between the, the, what's the difference between mindfulness and flow in that regard? If you're in a state of flow, is that somehow different from? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's a there's real immersion in the moment. Yeah. You tend to be at your most creative, have and you have the most capacity. Yeah. It tends to arise when the challenge of the moment is a perfect match for your skills at the moment. Yeah. Um, whereas meditation is much more conscious, right? Mm. You can lose a sense of self, but there, mm -hmm. there's a lot more awareness, I think. Right. Um, and it's a broader awareness. Right. Um, of course, this is difficult to articulate, but I think people who are familiar with both can point to the two experiences and, and um, yeah. know uh, experientially how they're different. I wonder, you spoke about how you work with the band mm -hmm. and how your capacity for mindfulness and kind of observing in a more maybe less impulsive way mm -hmm. um, is helpful for the group creative process but mm -hmm. you also do a lot of stuff on your own mm -hmm. how does that process look mm -hmm. i would say that that's more well first of all since since the music became my job uh 
there was a period of time when we were touring really heavily um, that it kind that 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 it, it used to have the function when I was a teenager of such such a strong function of being able to offer like a therapeutic release and all those kind of things that music can do for for people, and that kind of got honestly it got it got tainted when when it became my job i no longer looked for at a certain point um release it from music i would look for in in other ways um so when i do but and that takes so it just takes work to get back to a place where you can enjoy it in that way and and i think we've done it that's why it's taken frankly a long time for us to, to put our new record together because it, it took getting back to that place um but so then i find when i do creative stuff on my own i'm really not ambitious about it in a career sense and i'm really not too uh, worried about what happens with it and so it's since it's largely personal in that regard at this point um if maybe in the future it won't be so so much so but um it, it's more of a process of just letting just whatever kind of sub personality might be nagging at me or whatever um just just allowing myself to explore it and and just feel how that feels when you go when you go through it if i'm i'm thinking about playing the piano in my apartment by myself or um uh, and try and writing little things in there or i do work writing scripts and um i do a lot of writing just you know with with words and uh just to, just to kind of let that process um be what it is in the moment and not be so worried about canonizing it you know uh not so worried about coming up with a crystallized project product that i can then share with people because that's the side of it that has kind of worn worn the magic out for me you know yeah so i was curious to ask about that was it you said you were touring a lot and yeah. almost doing your job as a musician is that what sort of killed the the magic for you um i th that's broadly speaking i would say yes broadly speaking i would say yes that makes me, when you ask that it makes me think about what the function of music is in the first place you know and when i think about um i guess if i just go a few centuries back you know just the the way that it was used as a as a as a way of expressing community as of celebrating of commemorating certain events or expressing expressing sorrow and or um and what it became on the tour was more like a circus almost you know like you you're you you become detached from the reason um although you you're sustained by the fact that the reason is that other people are having that experience in the audience you know hopefully that they're they're finding meaning in in what you're doing but it's it's hard to stay connected to the um kind of emotional impetus and so that can be you know hurtful at the, it's it almost feels like a betrayal in a way when it gets to a certain point because um it doesn't feel truthful to be expressing the form of the, the expressing the form without this kind of what the spirit underneath you know um so that whole thing became uh just it, it, it made, made this this was a struggle that we went through and i think like i don't want i don't want to sound ungrateful you know um but um because i'm extremely grateful and and this it's on us to to find our way back to the emotional core of things but and and we i think we have but um yeah, no, it, ju it just felt like the forms of music. It, it was hard to pick up a guitar again, or hard to sit down at the piano again and, and find expression. It felt like I needed to look elsewhere for that at a certain point. Yeah. As a music fan, I'm always super curious to know how emotionally alive yeah. the musician on stage feels. Yeah. And of course, I could imagine like one of your fans finding out that you were just sort of phoning it in one night yeah. even though you're kind of going through emotions might find that a bit disappointing well i would i would i would say that what ended, what ended up happening because we were desperate not to phone it in and mm -hmm. i can't really remember very many times when we phoned it in because what ended up happening I'll, if i speak frankly was that we it became self-destructive and that took on i know a certain interest of its own from a fan's perspective because there was mm -hmm. desperation in the performances and we were drinking really heavily and we were um you know you could see that there was kind of like blood sweat and tears underneath the performance and so it was not the same and there was it, it didn't come from the same place that the writing of the music did but it still had all the kind of emotional power because we just refused to let to, to kind of roll over you know and so it as as destructive as that was i think it still had emotional truth to it because we were really going through something and then the the structure of the song it, the structure of the performance still allowed us to express that mm -hmm. but um you know, you can see how that would be, 
you know, a problem in and of itself. You're, you're, that, that, that was both the expression and then it became a separate problem of its own that needed a kind of a separate outlet of ex expression, you know. Uh, and it couldn't be a public performance thing at that point. It couldn't, and, and to me at that point I was react, reacting so strongly against it that it couldn't even be music, you know. I started to take refu ref, like refuge in books and um, just time in nature and I started to exercise more and uh, I, I tried to stop drinking so much and uh, um, that became the outlet that was I was trying to use to get away from the whole touring beast. But but I but I I, I wouldn't say that we phoned it in at, mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. So if I'm getting that, I'm understanding that that there was something really frustrating about not being able to connect with the music in an authentic way, presumably because you're saying playing the same songs over and over and over again, and, and you sort of lost touch with the source of the creative energy. Mm. But then that frustration became like built up a life of its own mm. and you were in a way expressing that mm -hmm. that's the sort of dis the self-destructive piece it's, it's something like that it's something like that I, i'm not sure it had necessarily to do with the repetition of playing the songs mm. um it it, it might have been something that I, I i a lot a lot of touring musicians have have expressed similar problems mm -hmm. about this touring life and um i'm not exactly sure what what it is but um part of it is probably part of it is um the extent you get you, first of all i think you become desensitized to so, normal human social norms you know to to have um that kind of reaction that you get from a stage yes. is not normal you know and and uh and <laughs> what do you mean by that um well the the way that I think about it, this fits funny because, I, and this is really silly because I, I, I I've been everybody like everybody's following the NBA playoffs right now sure. because the Raptors are doing so well. And when I watch, um, I watch Kawhi Leonard and and the star, and he's like so stoic all the time. Yeah. And it's be, and it's, it seems to be common among great athletes, often not always, but but also among you know really successful people a lot of the time that it's like getting caught up in the response to the thing is a distraction from the thing itself, and the real meaning comes from. Mm following through that whole trajectory without the kind of um, succumbing to the little ebbs and flows along the way and looking at the bigger arc you know and and knowing what you're really um geared towards but the thing is that when you're when you're traveling uh as a touring musician like it's really hard to um separate yourself from that kind of that like supercharged social um, yes. response of, of a lot of people cheering for what you're doing, you know, and watching you for, uh, as you stand up there and do this silly dancing stuff that you do. Um, and so it's really a huge struggle to, to first of all, uh, separate what you're doing from the judgment of it somehow. Like, what, oh, that was good. Good job. Cheer, cheer, clap, clap, clap. You know, that was bad, you know, bad performance that didn't go well. Well, it's not really the point, you know, like you're, you're the, the idea is more to, Find the voice that you hear in your head or that you want to express, develop it as well as you can and, and then confidently um, express it and don't worry about what anybody thinks about it. Just do the next thing after that. Keep moving forward, you know? And so, um, but it's, it's the, cha the challenge on tour is that that's just really not the way it's set up. It's more set up like, here's what we're doing. Okay, clap, clap. That was good, you know? And so you, you, for, you get caught up in that. You, then you get desensitized to that. Then you try to chase the feeling that you felt the first time that it happened. And, and, uh, all, and, and then you don't also have like these like little uh, mundane things like your, your routine is totally disrupted. Yeah. Your sleep schedule is totally disrupted. Your diet is shit, you know? Like, and uh, um, so all those things add up, I guess. All those things add up. I want to pick up on this comment about getting caught up in the feedback, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, understanding to the extent that I do the human brain and the needs of a human being, doing something with your hands and then 20,000 people screaming and applauding and adoring you for it has got to be among the most rewarding or even addictive things mm -hmm. that you could do mm -hmm. outside of drugs, although presumably, you know, a lot of musicians drink or, you know, mm -hmm. drugs are part of mm -hmm. life on the road. So that's maybe even enhancing the effect. Mm -hmm. Is that what gets you caught up is just how rewarding and how powerful a stimulus that is? I think so. I think so. And I think the inverse is, 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 is the same too. If something doesn't go well and you get that negative feeling and then you don't want that to happen again, like that's, it's a really powerful, uh, like re reinforcement system. It's really hard to, 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 especially because when I first started this, I was only 19 or 20 or whatever. Right. And like, that's when you're the most susceptible to these. Well, 
maybe a, a few years younger, even more so. But um, no, you're, you're right. You're right. That's right. In you're the so susceptible sweet spot. to what people think of you. Uh, you're, I was a young man. And I wanted to. I wanted to make my way. You know, and I was. I was ambitious, and I wanted to. I wanted to do well and I wanted people to know I was doing well. And um, then when things started to go well for the band, well, I really got a, you know, huge like shot of that feeling. And um, I was definitely not immune to letting that, to, to feeling what that makes you feel like, you know, like yeah. uh, it's like put, you put when it's the similar kind of feeling to when you put your really cool vacation picture on Instagram and more people like it than ever before and whatever, you know, <laughs> that feels great, you know, or yeah. you take a risk with some other kind of photo and like nobody comments or whatever, then it's like, you know, it feels really bad. So if I want to feel what it's like to like play guitar solo on stage in front of 50,000 yeah. people, I should just put like a cool picture of myself on Instagram and hope yeah. a lot of people like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's just a little bit more amplified. It is just more amplified, <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and then in terms of the, the the drinking thing and all that, the, the drugs part of it, it's like, one thing's for sure is that if you feel that feeling while you've been drinking, that your brain is going to tell you, um, you know, you know, keep drinking because that seems to go really, really great. Those, right. those things get linked up too and I think that's why addiction and music, music, musicians, it's it's such a... You know, the the emotional response is just so strong that those things become just hardwired together. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you talked about trying to find your way back, yeah, to connecting with the sort of the source or like the kind of authentic, yeah, dynamic of creating and performing music, yeah. And you talked about going back into nature and getting away from music. How, how did you? How exactly? How did the process go of finding your way back? It was messy. It was really messy um, because um, that that became kind of the the point where maybe if you if you if you um, compare it to a relationship that when a relationship is going badly, you, you'll be susceptible to doing little things that will destroy it. You know, um, be, subconscious things that will destroy it, and and uh, st some some stuff like that was happening. I think within the band at a certain point that um, we knew something was not going right. We didn't really have control over it. It seemed like our job was to keep the machine going, uh, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of other people involved, a lot of other people getting paid, um, and so um, it it took a. It, it took a kind of a messy process of self-evaluation to, to get back on track. And um, there was like, we were, we had some fights within the band, um, uh, not necessarily about that, but definitely related to that. And it was kind of the, the just the, the Phoenix thing, you know, we burned everything down in order to see what remained, you know? And there was a, there was a point to see that, that I, that I thought that, um, I, I think we were all open to seeing if we really if if we really like we're open to this not going forward you know we're open to this not going forward so let's see what that looks like in our mind and let's see and just really explore that really imagine that and see what's left and then luckily I, when we when we really examined that and when I really examined that for myself as well it took months but it looked like at the bottom there was still there was still some work to be done between us you know there was still um something that we wanted to say that we're still collaborating that seemed like would be meaningful um and the, the 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 bond that we had musically seemed to be worth whatever else we had to um sacrifice going forward and that felt really truthful and so from that place we were able to rebuild again and from i think it could only really come from that place i really think that if we had keep kept just trying to push the machine forward that it would have it would have um eventually it exploded and totally it, it would have totally ended mm -hmm. um, and so from then we were from then we were really able to rebuild it had to do with airing out all our grievances between each other it had to do for me a lot with refining my skill set again and really practicing my instrument and spending I spent like a year practicing the piano um, and reading everything I could get my hands on to feel like a confident person again you know mm -hmm. to feel like I wasn't just someone that would go out and do the same old dance every night that I had new ideas and that I was a, a more mature person and that I had something to say that wasn't just uh, pantomime or something, you know? Um, and so it was kind of a maturation proce process. I would say I felt really like I've kind of became a man. Like I was, I was my, I was crystallized in a teenage state because I was 19 when it first started happening. And um, it was like, it was like when, the, when that happened, it was like it, a snapshot of me was taken developmentally and in every sense you know and that was taken and it was just dragged across the road for like three or four years and I wasn't allowed to I, not that I wasn't allowed but I wasn't able to um, to let my life continue you know and so it was really upsetting to at a certain point look at myself and realize um, like wow like uh, 
I might, I might have lost a few years of my own growth here, you know, like that's depressing and or it's horrifying, you know. Um, but then, then to realize after that, well, I can definitely still do something about this and the people that I'm working with and collaborating with are in the same circumstances so we can do this together. Mm. And then maybe we can still write around that, you know, maybe that can be our inspiration. And, and, and so those all became kind of points of hope. Um, and so uh, hopefully, hopefully the new record uh, reflects some of that, you know, yeah. hopefully we didn't screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a very interesting kind of narrative arc, right? Over the last, what, two, three years, mm-hmm. maybe, or more? Mm-hmm. About three years. Or three years. Mm-hmm. And you sort of arrived at this, I don't know, new equilibrium or something. So you have this new wisdom, you have this new sense of how to take care of yourself and how to take care of the band. I'd be curious to hear, and of course, this is a, a challenge for a lot of people, right? You go through something, you learn, you figure it out. Now, how do I sustain? Mm-hmm. How do I sustain myself? How yeah. do I maintain the gains? Yeah. Right? So, so you have to um, take care of yourself in a way so that you can keep growing, keep going as a person. Mm-hmm. You have to nurture the talent that you have or the, the skill set that you have. That's how you're going to earn a living and, mm-hmm. and have some level of fulfillment in your life. Mm-hmm. What are the key elements or the key practices you're going to try to maintain both for yourself and maybe even for the band going forward yeah because chances are i mean you guys have a big tour coming up yeah really big there's a yeah yeah, you're going all through the summer and into the fall and yeah it's going to go on from there all over the world yeah what are you doing to to set yourself up for success uh, for the next round yeah although that's a great question and i'm nervous about it because like like uh, i haven't really done an extensive tour since uh like 2016 or so 2015 and 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 uh so i'm nervous i know the demons to avoid you know i know the things to avoid um like what one thing that i've been thinking just recently and i was just talking to devin the singer earlier uh today about it like there there's things that um performance wise that you dread that that songs that you that you feel like you don't want to play because they're difficult and this kind of thing and that can often the that's just a little thing, but just to try to, tr- to try to treat the things that have caused you trouble in the past, um, like a, a project that once once you once you once you get past that, you can it, that that will cause you know more meaning in your experience and not be afraid of the things that you've been afraid of in the past. And a lot of it's just behavioral stuff, you know, like and, and really mm-hmm. controlling the 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 schedule. And I, so I'm worried about the things that I'm worried about are basically being able to keep myself healthy like that's the main thing not drink too much not let my diet get too too bad make sure that the sleep stuff doesn't get out of control because from there really it's it's kind of it seems mundane but everything can slide away as soon as those it, little things can become, become big things when your physical health is is not taken care of and um i because i think from there it, like because the next thing i would say is to try to keep my mind engaged in uh uh engaged creatively one way or another with with books or with instruments or with whatever on the road that's it that's crucial so you don't feel like you're just stagnating on the road um so like health comes before that because health comes first uh and it's it, and it's important um beyond that like i like i like i said i'm a little bit nervous i, I i'm just gonna try to uh stay aware and um watch for what problems may arise i still don't know how the record's going to be received i'm i'm optimistic about it so i don't know really what the touring experience is going to be like um it's, it feels like i'm about to like a like, you know i'm just about to like get on the boat and go at sea, go to sea for like you know 18 months like in the 18th century or something i don't know what's going to happen i don't know what people i'm going to encounter as so i don't know i'm going to bring us back to some of the territory we covered earlier on in the discussion i'm wondering how you see mindfulness helping you through the tour and life on the road and um, kind of sustaining yourself For, I don't know I don't know if this is uh, if this is um, something that other people that practice mindfulness do too maybe you can tell me but l- when I first started practicing it's I felt like I could you developed a, I developed a framework um, that it's almost like you, when you have a little problem after that, after having practiced for a little while, then you can just kind of shoot your mind into a, a mindfulness snapshot for a second. And, and then you, you think, oh yeah, you know, kind of like that. Like you don't need to necessarily sit there and meditate um, every time. And so um, like that, to, to me, that process right there, it just go, like, if you're, oh, there's a problem. Okay, what about the mindful, mindfulness thing? Then you go, boom, and you, and you have a, a shot, right? Uh, and then you, can, then you start to remember things that are often like, oh, yeah, what's my objective? Um, what is that feeling, you know? Um, what is that person feeling, you know? Um, uh, 
like what is this sensation telling me you know rather than inhabiting the sensation you ask what it's telling you and asking that question takes like a fraction of a second right mm -hmm. and so that for me I, has become kind of the essence of what mindfulness means is just that little snapshot that it gives you know um and the, so that's why i kind of i stumble with my words a little bit about it sometimes because i know i don't have the definition of mindfulness quite right i have a kind of personal um relationship with that exact thing that i just described maybe most people have their own personal relationship with these things too what you just described is incredibly clear and mm. a beautiful experiential kind of description of how mindfulness is sort of brought online in real life right it's the idea is not that one meditates through a problem the idea is that the meditation practice is there so that in the moment where something difficult comes up yeah the capacity to step back and take the snapshot as you say yeah. is more readily available right right so you sound like a lot of the people that I teach meditation to. I guess I'm curious if mindfulness is useful in any way in the process of creativity, mm -hmm. whether it's your own personal creativity or with the band. Yeah, right. So then building on what I just, the way I just described it, just those snapshots, I'd say it's it's valuable in that way, incorporating those that, that snapshot. Like, like you kind of mentioned, um, uh, I forget what the study was called, but when they actually do brain scans of people who are told to improvise and whatever, that that um yeah, maybe I'll just I'll just briefly introduce that. So there's some very cool brain imaging studies done with jazz musicians who were improvising in a scanner, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe I could be wrong about this, but I believe there was a, a very strong deactivation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, whether that's the brain region or not, the interpretation was that these uh, musicians are incredibly good at shutting down their sense of self-consciousness, self-criticism, or self-analysis, and they're just fully in immersed in the moment and letting whatever creative skill they have just express itself with ease. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, it's not clear that that's necessarily a mindful state. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just thinking. Yeah, that's go ahead. closer to a state of flow, maybe. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the difference between those things, that would be more for the experts to talk about. But but it seems it seems like the the concept of kind of shooting back and forth between these different kinds of states, between different levels of self awareness. Um, not to make it sound all esoteric or anything. It's just that you're th you're you're allowing yourself to be inhabited, just totally in the music, or you're kind of checking back in to see what's happening, to check your direction, and maybe make a recalibration, and then to reimmerse yourself. And that happens like really in the fraction of a second. And it's not even clear whether it's it's not always clear to me whether or not it's even useful to be aware that that's what's happening, uh -huh. right? Like, because you don't always want to know how the sausage is made, you know? Like, <laughs> I, I, I think you think about, like, um, you, about great geniuses when, when I think about, like, you know, I'm thinking about Miles Davis or something. Like, there's no way that guy was, you know, like, well, I don't know. Who knows what he was thinking, but, but, um, or what his brain was doing, but we're not all Miles Davis. And so uh, it has been useful for me to, Add an, this, it feels like another tool in my arsenal, you know, another weapon that I have that I can, when, when I started practicing mindfulness, it just it kind of put more of a name mm -hmm. to that process of kind of stepping outside your experience and taking a snapshot. And then to be able to have that just kind of really in your tool belt for when you, you might need it, um, especially helpful when you're collaborating. But even on your own, even on my own, I'm, I'm thinking like, you're, you, you know, you might be stuck up against a wall, you know, and, and then just to step back and just, oh, you realize that you've gone down a, a kind of a rabbit hole here and so then you you go back to what worked and and um so it can help you i think mindfulness can help organize your creativity mm -hmm. maybe and uh yeah so i had this guy p kirchmer on the podcast recently he trains elite athletes among other people uh, in mindfulness and for elite athletes and other peak performers being able to be totally immersed in the moment and not be self-conscious and and not be overcome by stress or anxiety is hugely important mm -hmm. and these people are uh, really focused on having flow in their performance mm -hmm. and i'm sure as a musician you experience flow quite a bit mm -hmm. and the idea with this kind of training is to 
use mindfulness to help set the conditions for flow. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. sort of little pithy statement for it um, is to say, flow sort of emerges by accident, mm-hmm. and mindfulness just makes you more accident prone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a, I think that's great. I think that's a really great way of putting it. I think it's yeah. a really great way of putting it. It, 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 it I think. Um, it, like it really reminds me of that of, of uh, the athletic kind of comparison that I made that I made earlier because it, I, I think that it, it, the more that I I found the more that I prepare for a moment um, and usually that moment for me is the moment of collaboration with the band when we both all get into the room together the more I can prepare for that in advance with. Um, just getting all the, all the different kind of tools that you need to, to, to it, it can just be practicing scales, it can be practicing mindfulness, it can be just reflecting quietly about something else um, or going to a museum or whatever. And then all those things, you know, you, it, it makes you feel like you have kind of uh, just some substance, uh, uh, some, some, some content, you know, that w- and when you get into a moment that you're yeah. prepared to disperse it uh, in ways that, you know, are, are free and open and you can be, you can feel a level in that moment from your preparedness you know I learned something interesting I did a, a contract with Pete actually recently mm-hmm. um, working did a, I did a training with some Canadian Olympic athletes mm-hmm. and during the Q&A at the end one of the athletes said you know when I first started practicing uh, <clears throat> mindfulness I found my performances actually got worse okay and that was, you know, we were a little concerned to hear that because we were trying to introduce people into this uh, practice and get them excited about it and stuff. And his comment was that um, he just became more self-conscious around his performances. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's pretty common when one is first learning to practice that this sort of sense of self sort of gets in the way. Yeah. But again, uh, as one develops the skill uh, more deeply, the awareness can be used to, again, sort of set the conditions, right? And I found it interesting because you were talking about when you're on the road, making sure you're taking care of your sleep, Mm -hmm. making sure you're taking care of your diet, Mm -hmm. stuff to maintain your basic capacities Mm -hmm. so that obstacles like fatigue or feeling malnourished or whatever don't get in the way. Right. I also really like this comment you made about stepping out taking the mindful snapshot making whatever adjustments are needed whether it's to your lifestyle or behavioral routines Mm -hmm. or to music Mm -hmm. right and then you dive right back in yeah 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 exactly exactly um yeah no it's 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 been a super valuable tool in that way that's there's for sure kind of switching channels a little bit here i'm curious to get your sense of what it's like to be in the role of a celebrity Mm -hmm. now Obviously, you're not, I don't know, a Kardashian, no. <laughs> last I checked. Um, but you are a public figure, pretty well known. And obviously, the celebrity lifestyle is uh, has a lot of trappings or has a lot of pitfalls uh, when it comes to mental health mm-hmm. and well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering how you navigate like what, what you experience as a celebrity and how you navigate that and sort of maintain a level head. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you're right. I'm definitely not on the, not even close to the level of what, like where my privacy is really a, that big of a problem or um, I can go anywhere I want, you know, and, and, and I can enjoy my time without, it, when people come up to me in the street, it really only happens, most of the time it just happens in, in Quebec and they just have something really nice to say. So it's really pleasant in that way. But, so the main pitfall for me has been, um, just that feeling like the things that you do are so subject to a judgment, a value judgment, you know, um, because it's such it's such a distraction. It's such an unhealthy distraction. I find. There, I th- I've heard somebody say. I think it's almost probably almost a cliche now that now that with the way that social media is, everyone's like their own little celebrity, you know, mm. um, because I think that's something that has to do something like with with like that is that you're you're. You're, every, everything that you do is kind of idealized and then a value judgment is placed on it literally like you know um, uh, and, and or people comment that it's great or something and that's just not the most important thing in fact it's far from the most important thing those are m- idealized micro moments that are then used as checkpoints to represent your experience or represent your or and then they're they're lined up and and your your the, the story of your life kind of becomes based on that somehow 
you know, I'm exaggerating, but there's a sense in which that's true. And then when you start to become known by more people, your life becomes even more idealized and the value judgments for better or for worse. Well, I think even if on the, if it's ostensibly for better, it's still long term for worse because the more that you kind of accept that as a story of your life, the less ownership that you have over your life. And just the more like really, if I did something uh, on a record or on stage or whatever that you think is great, well, that's great, but it's not like me feeling like you think that is great is going to make me rep. That's not what led me there in the first place. It was the whole, the whole, the whole, my whole childhood and everything that I did in my life led me there. And so uh, then to try to, you, you, you know, you're tempted to replicate things that people liked and that they told you that that they liked and to avoid things that they told you that they didn't like and then as soon as you start playing that game you're in big trouble you know you're in big trouble and so um the way to navigate that is not always clear because just you have you have to be real with yourself and, and to acknowledge that well no you you like the feeling you like the feeling of of that acceptance and you hate the feeling that what that that comes from people um disapproving of something that you that you've done um uh, and so uh, you can't just block it out you know you can't and uh and it's it, so it's complicated the 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 way that I've tended to deal with it. Well, we've been we've been away for a few years, so I've been just like kind of in a in a retreat, um, and I feel more ready than ever to deal with that kind of thing. But um, it's ju it's just been to 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 find one thing that I kn know is is a good outlet, and then just to kind of it's a, another kind of just a a, a behavioral solution, and mm -hmm. just engage in that. You know, um, what you do know, you? What's an example of that? An example of that would be if if you start to feel yourself. Um, susceptible to, to towards uh if, if i start to feel like um like 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 I'll, I'll like just like i know that practicing the piano is is a is a good thing to do you know is a good thing to do so as soon if i'm in my house and i'm staring at instagram or if i'm uh just having thoughts about um, myself as a certain kind of person i know that if i just start practicing the piano that that's going to be good you know that's that's just an example i i use exercise in that way i use talking to my parents in that way um uh i use writing in my journal in that way and so any if any one of those things is at my fingertips when this any kind of thought process along these lines that I'm describing emerges that I just turn to the other thing and that that tends to engage me in more of a long-term arc uh, rather than a kind of a short-term pleasure boost or whatever that might be so I would just try to I guess it's it's a matter of looking to try to it's you could you could be mindful about it you, you try to look back and see what's my goal where am I aiming here am I trying to aim at being the most uh, um, accepted by the most amount of people or like you know just start to ask yourself those questions and, and then hopefully uh, you can avoid the the trappings yeah. I wonder if this is like you're going to give a similar answer I'm curious about the tendency for the constraints of the business side of things to influence your experience of being a musician and even the creation of music mm -hmm. how do you navigate the demands of the commercial uh, side of things knowing that you need to make a living mm -hmm. and it's probably fun to have a radio hit mm -hmm. how does that how do you navigate that mm -hmm. well there, there I've, def, I've, I've definitely learned although it's not always um, easy to remember but I've learned um, through real concrete experience in my life that um, every single time you try to do what the business thinks it wants from you you it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't know what it wants you know the business doesn't know the 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 business analytical side of things is uh, it's too analytical for its own good. The more that you can uh, find the emotional core of what you're trying to say, the more it will relate to the most people. And so there, it is a, it is a really similar answer. Um, I found that making this record, um, there has been pressure from the business side of things. We have great business partners, and I so. Uh, uh, and so I'm not talking specifically about anybody, but um, what the tendency is in the business side of the music industry, and I think this is true about most industries, is to look at what has worked and then um, look at what you know this new product is trying to do and, and compare it to what has worked, you know, and then to try to adjust it to make it fit more into what has worked. And uh, that's not the realm that creative people occupy, you know? Um, it, it, the, the realm that creative people occupy when they're at their best is to... Um, provide new examples of what works, you know, and then maybe other people want to imitate it or maybe not. But, um, so the, it, 
it helps to have good collaborators that you trust, that you know when these difficult moments come up and people are asking you for something, asking for changes that it's not coming from the right place that you can look to each other for support and I'm fortunate to have that in the band. Um, but it's a similar kind of thing that, that what, what's, you know, what's, what's, I, you try to ask yourself, what's the purpose of trying to make something, uh, uh, you know, commercially comparable to other things like it, you know? Well, it's, it's, it's not, it's, that's not, that's not what I'm in the business of doing, you know, it's not, I'm, I'm in the business of trying to uh, take whatever I feel and to express it in a musical way, you know, like that's, uh, and that if I'm doing that, I have business, business success as well, because I'm not against business success. I'm not against making money or any of that. Um, even if you want to look at it from a strictly, strictly business perspective, I could take my own, I could, I could make you a chart that says that how many times uh, I tried to follow like a business analytical path that somebody else laid out for me and how many times that worked out, especially in the long term. You know, it's a bad idea for the business, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's not like every time somebody expresses some emotion authentically, it turns into a commercial success. Mm -hmm. So there's some level of uncertainty there, right? Right, right. right. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, and 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 I guess what I the little rant I just went on there, it, it's it that that's like that's expressing kind of. An exaggerated version of one side of it because of course mm -hmm. as a as a uh, as a creative person you're also you realistically comparing yourself to other things because that's that's kind of uh, how you I don't know there's a there, there's a that's the, there's a friendly competition even that you could that you can use to to you know well that 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 was a really pro, the, musically you know that was a really you heard some other record that was a really provocative emotionally risky um, take on something and then you think well oh I didn't realize that that was acceptable maybe I can push it even further you know mm -hmm. um, and so there's there's those kind of things to think of there's also just again I, I keep coming back to it but there's the the, the technical proficiency of the, of the thing and right. you know you know you can't you know I think of Yoko Ono or something you know it's like maybe that's a maybe that's an authentic kind of emotional expression but it's sure isn't very refined and it sure isn't very pleasant you know um, you know that, that <laughs> I don't know why I brought her. <laughs> but yeah, no. But there has to be other elements other than just you know that kind of you know raw emotional purity. Right. You know, yeah. And there are a lot of very successful artists, commercially successful artists, that don't have very much talent. Yeah. And you know, maybe maybe I should have more nuance there. Presumably, some level of artistic ability. Um, is 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 required? You have to pass a certain certain threshold. Although in the history of pop music, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are borderline exceptions to that. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder how you think about the technical aspect. Right? Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like it's an edge for you. It keeps you growing and mm -hmm. keeps you interested. keeps mm -hmm. keeps you in flow. Mm -hmm. um, but is that really necessary? That's, to be uh, yeah. successful again that's a good question i think that part of why i say that is because i'm a bit reactionary myself against what i perceive in the current musical landscape to be a real uh n neglect towards that side of things uh, my genre roughly speaking indie rock um i think that there's a, frankly a lot of slackers in my genre i don't think that people learn how to play their guitars properly and i think that the musicianship is just not at a very good level and i think that that's one way that we can set ourselves apart and that's also something that i think is um well, I think it's important when I think about the musicians, like I, I, I think back to the 60s and 70s and the bands that were um, happening around then, like, you know, the, people just can't really play the guitar like like Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page and people like that anymore. You know, there's something missing. Part of it is that they really made their bones um, when they were developing their chops, you know. Um, and there was a there was a cultural moment that they were able to take advantage of and all those kinds of things but no i i do think it's important but then i also know that when it becomes too uh too much you know um too stuffy you know too uh too rigid that it's it's really valuable for the counter wave to come and wash it all away and to have um something more uh r raw, rough you know something a little more uh rock and roll or whatever you know like it, i love the music from the 50s too which is like you know that's that's um 
Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley all reacting against, you know, how much is that doggy in the window? And, you know, all that, that, that kind of uh, that, that, that really stuffy kind of uh, post-war music and whatever. And, and so th- both are valid. I guess mainly why I would focus on the technical side of things right in this moment is because I really feel like, especially in my genre, it's something that's lacking. Mm-hmm. All right. So you guys are working on the album now, getting it out soon, hitting the road. Mm-hmm. What's in store more in the long run? And and I'm not necessarily asking for your specific life plans, mm-hmm. but what is it that's going to nurture you in the long run in terms of your life as an artist? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that it's, there's a lot of uncertainty in this job and in this life. And I don't know, I have no idea what my life is going to be like in 10 years um, or even five years. Um, if, I, if I'm speaking honestly, I really don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I want to have a family one day, but um, I want to stay... I think I want to stay active in the in the creative arts, but I'm interested in all kinds of things. Um, I guess right in this moment, I, I'm, I'm more thinking, thinking along the lines of... I just... What, what can I say? That... that, that you know, a lot of the, the the journey that I've been on in the past three or four years has led me to a kind of place where now mm-hmm. um, it's it's different. I'm not in a state of turmoil right now, you know, and I'm not in a state of of trying to claw my way up a ladder at this moment. I've just finished making the record, and I'm now I feel like I'm just watching to see what's going to come next, you know, and and I want to be able to watch and react to things, and I don't really feel like I have such a mountain in front of me in this exact moment, um, and so. I don't know, you know, I don't know what's going to come next. (laughs) Spoken like a true practitioner. (laughs) Uh, Connor, is there anything else you want to add? Anything we didn't touch on you think is important for this conversation? Well, um, I'm happy with what we've covered. Although I would say that I'm really excited by the field that you occupy and the, um, not just mindfulness, but the I, I I know a little bit about the directions that your business is expanding into, and that the field is expanding into, and I think it's really amazing. It's it, the way the way that um, kind of meditation practice and um, is linking up with really advanced neuroscience and a lot of the stigmas about things like you know psilocybin research and one thing and another that that those are all kind of fusing and coming into this place. It feels like an accelerating field of study you know and 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 i think it's really helping a lot of people it really helped me and uh so i'm thrilled to see where it's going to go in the next few years i hope it i hope it uh i hope it does as well as how i feel like it can do you know that's awesome thank you for saying that before we sign off here uh maybe i can just give you a moment to just talk about where people can hear your music and come see you live and all that kind of stuff Mm mm-hmm well, we're working with really advanced marketing metrics now, so it's going to come into your Instagram feed whether you like it or not. Um, <laughs> and uh, but if you do want to go look for it, just halfmoonrunner.com is uh, where all our tour dates will be listed, and we're on social media and all over the internet. <laughs> cool. All right, Connor, thank you so much for doing this. It's been you. really fun. Yeah, great. Thanks. All right, take care. Thanks for listening to the Mindspace podcast. I hope it was inspiring. If you feel the world could use a little more mind space, please consider supporting the podcast. The best way to do that is to leave a review on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen, or share your favorite episode on social media. Thanks and be well. <laughs>